tap trees like that get sap from? We do. They'll produce sap. The, the danger is that these are weak spots. Right? That's a weak spot. This is a weak spot. And this is a weak spot. Those trees are going to continue to grow in, in, in what we refer to as occupied growing space. At some point, you're going to get a windstorm and those are going to snap. That windstorm may be five years down the road or 15 years down the road. During that time frame, they're, they're taking away growing resources from a, maybe a better tree that's next to it. Another benefit of thinning, and foresters have known this for a long time, when you thin, your trees grow, grow faster. And I'll illustrate that from this study. The advantage of fast tree growth for maple producers is that it allows you to comply with capping guidelines. And I'll talk about this at length. But in essence, when you tap a tree, the minimum tapping diameter is 10 inches. That 10 inches has, an, there's an assumption that the tree is growing fast enough that by the time you work your way around the tree, the tree has put new wood over that original tap hole so that you're not tapping old wood, you're always tapping clean wood. So fast growth helps us comply with the tapping guidelines. It also um, increases the rate of tap hole closure. You can remove these, what I talked about earlier, some of these risky trees and poor performers. Um, these, these are trees that are probably not growing fast to begin with, and so you can, you can extract sap from them, but the growth rates are not going to be um, fast enough to allow you to comply with the tapping guidelines. By thinning, you're going to improve your efficiency of sap collection, whether it's buckets or tubing, uh, you'll have you'll get some of those trees that are producing less efficiently, essentially get them out of the way, and so you're not allocating resources to tubing or buckets or trail systems, so you can collect that sap. There's um, there's there's a real it's, it's hard, and you know, I I I work in the hard out forest sugar bush, and so I understand the you know, it's hard to walk by a maple tree that's of adequate size, even if it's one that looks like it's defective and not drill a hole in it, right? Because you're, you're thinking it's probably going to give you some sap, and some sap's better than no sap. But for the, how many, any, any bucket collectors here? Okay, so the, the bucket collectors have a huge advantage over tubing people, like we show here, because you know what's happening with every tree. The, the, the maple producers that have only collected with tubing don't really appreciate the variation that you get from one tree to the next. So the, the bucket producers have an advantage in that regard. By thinning, you're going to be able to maintain the size of the crown of the tree. And this is the, if there's one message that you take away from here today, the size of the crown, so this, this portion of the tree that has foliage on it, that has the branches, is the most essential index of the productivity of that tree for sugar, <coughs> the sugar concentration of the sap, and then the size of the tree for the volume of the sap. When you thin, particularly in a younger sugar bush, you're able to maintain the growth of those trees so that you can maintain the size of the crown. Okay? The, the, the logic, the, the mechanism for that is that the, the branches support the leaves, more le the leaves produce the sugar, more healthy functioning leaves, more sugar, higher quality sap. One way that we can index the, the size of the crown and the, and the, uh, the, the predict the sugar concentration from a tree is to measure what's called live crown ratio. The live crown ratio is if you take the total height of the tree, and that's the green bar, let's say for this tree it's 100 feet, and then you measure the height of the tree from that's just the live crown part, which is the red bar, we'll say that's 80 feet. That gives us a live crown ratio of 80%. You get 80% in the woods, woods grown trees? Anybody? I want to see your woods if you do. <laughs> woods grown trees are more like, what are they? 30%, 20%, or maybe 40%? So that's competition for sunlight. The, the yard trees you'll get 80% on. In the woods, if you thin when they're, and most maple producers aren't doing this, but if you thin when the sugar bush is really young, 
can maintain those lower branches. As soon as, as, soon as the crowns of your, of your trees start to grow together, the lower branches die back, right? You've seen that. You walk in the woods, the lower branches are dead, the upper branches are alive. You're not going to grow new branches lower. So if you thin young, when the woods are young, you'll maintain those lower branches. The trees continue to grow taller. You'll increase the percentage of live crown. So by thinning, you can, you can halt the loss of live crown, but you're, unless the trees are still growing taller, you're not going to increase the percentage of live crown. These are some numbers that uh, Bob Morrow developed back in the 50s that looks at um, the relationship between three parts of the tree. So the live crown ratio, the diameter, or diameter of the tree, DBH is diameter of breast height, or the crown diameter, and live crown ratio was to have the highest predictive capacity of sugar concentration. So we want deep crowns and wide crowns. Another benefit of thinning is that you can produce some supplemental product. Firewood for your wood stove, firewood for your evaporator, saw logs for timber, uh, building a barn, whatever. And then the question that we were trying to get at is whether or not, I mean, at some level it makes sense, and you say, well, why do you do research to do this? But we weren't, we didn't understand fully the, the, the specific relationships. But if the trees are growing faster, shouldn't they produce higher sugar concentration? It makes sense if the trees grow faster, they produce more leaves, and you should end up with more sugar. But we wanted to be able to, to truly establish that relationship and then also be able to answer the question, how many trees should we cut? Should we cut really hard, or should we cut a little bit lighter? So we were looking at those first few bullets up there um, illustrate the, what we've talked about. More foliage should relate to more sugar. And what, are, what we're, it gets down to is based on some research from Quebec, where Quebec, of course, produces 85% of the world's syrup. They have a lot of... of of research that goes into how trees grow and how to produce syrup. And what they found was that when you produce faster growing trees have faster xylem vessels. And the xylem are the white wood of the tree and that's what conducts the water in the tree. The bigger those, the, bit, the faster the tree is growing, the bigger the xylem vessels are the diameter. And those larger diameter xylem vessels um, have better storage of the sugars have a, a greater capacity to provide internal differential pressure for the release of sap, and then also to release the sugars from conversions from starches. So it made sense then to test the, the research that we were doing was to say, if we grow these trees faster, uh, will they produce more sugar? All right, so we've defined thinning. It's removing the lower value trees, leaving the best trees behind. We've seen that there are several benefits to thinning, even if we never actually produce more sugar. There are still benefits to thinning. You want to know, do you need to thin your sugar bush? Or maybe you have two different sugar bushes or three different sugar bushes, sections of woods, and you want to know which of these should I put my effort into first. So we have to know when to thin. Knowing when to thin really comes down, so there's two ways that we can go about doing this. What we'll talk about here are some visual uh, clues that you can look for that that are an indication of how much sunlight you're getting is available to the trees that you're wanting to grow faster. You can hire a forester or work with a, a state agency forester to uh, to take some measurements in your woods that will give you a, a more refined look. But you'll get a pretty good idea based on some of these clues. So the first clue is during the summertime you go out and you look up into the canopy and you say, can I see any daylight? And there's a lot of woods, a lot of sugar bushes you go into, and the canopy is completely closed. That, that, now, it's not always, but it may be that's an indication there's not enough sunlight to go around. Another indication in that top right-hand picture, if you look at the shape of those crowns, those are two trees that have been competing for sunlight. They may have also had some mechanical um, interactions, such that the branches are not able to survive on those those insides of those trees. So these are two sugar maple trees, and you can see the shape of the crown uh, illustrates competition for sunlight. Now, 
those two trees are, as I recall, those two particular trees were free to grow on all other sides. So those two trees were not problematic necessarily. But if you go into your sugar bush and you look up, you know, the, the perfect tree, if there is such a thing, has crown on all sides, right? In your sugar bush, you're probably not going to see that. You'll see they'll have flat on one side and maybe rounded on three, or maybe they'll be flattened on two sides and elongated um, from, from one side to the other. So those are trees that are competing for sunlight. So that's a clue that there's competition. Another clue is if you start seeing dead branches low on the, low on the stem. Dead branches low on the stem are typically indicative of lack of sunlight. It's, it's not a health problem per se, it's just these are the trees don't have enough sunlight to maintain those lower branches. If you have dead branches on the top of your tree, that's a problem. That's a, that's the, the tree is not able to support those upper branches. It's a, it's a symptom of some other problem. The dead branches on the top of the tree are not the problem per se. That's just, a, that's just the signal that you need to look into some other problem. So dead lower branches are indicative of low sunlight. If you have occasion to cross-section a tree from your sugar bush, look at the growth rings. Anytime you cut down a tree, inspect the stump. That's, it's, uh, um, there's, there's a, a world of knowledge that's wrapped up in, in, that, in that stump or the cross-section of a log. And what you're looking for are the growth rates, how tightly packed the rings are. That upper picture shows, for those of you that were here earlier, you've seen this picture. This is a, a Norway spruce. But it, it shows the point that those two bars, the two blue bars, both cover 10 years of growth. So the short bar covers 10 years of growth, the long bar covers 10 years of growth. What happened with this tree, it was in a spruce plantation, the trees were growing well, you can see the size of the growth rings looks pretty good, and then the crowns grew together and the growth shut down. So if you have a, a maple tree in your sugar bush and it has something like this, it could be telling you one of two things, right? What's, what are the two things it might tell you? So I'll give you a hint. So if you have, because that's not really a good question, I can see that's not going to go anywhere. Um, if, you, if you cut, say you had this cross section from a tree that was part of the understory, would that be a low canopy sugar maple? Would that cause as much concern is if you had this kind of a growth pattern for a taller tree that was part of the upper canopy. So the lower canopy tree is not going to have enough sunlight, so you would expect it to be growing slower. So you may have a dead tree, the point is you may have a dead tree in your sugar bush and it has slow growth, that doesn't mean the upper canopy trees are also growing slow. The bottom picture illustrates a uh, lack of understory development. Nothing in the understory. Now that's nice when you're dragging tubing or carrying buckets, but it may indicate, again, here we've got two things that might explain that. One is a lack of sunlight, so there's not enough sunlight to the forest floor to stimulate some of that herbaceous plants or raspberries and other vegetation, or it may be that you have way too many deer, okay, or both. Okay. So the clues on thinning all relate to sunlight. So everything, you know, think about how plants in general respond to sunlight. The absence of sunlight is, is reflected in the way plants respond to that. So those are the clues that we use to think about whether or not we should be thinning. Uh, you should be cautious in whether or not you thin in a couple of circumstances. One, uh, if you see daylight, you may not need to thin or it may be that there's, there, you've had some recent stresses. We've had years where we've had forest tent caterpillar outbreaks and there's a fair amount of sunlight coming through. You usually you don't want to be thinning your woods when the trees are under stress. Another uh, very um, significant concern with thinning is if you have thin soils or shallow root systems. Now, usually sugar maple grows best on deeper well-drained soils, so this doesn't happen a lot. But if you have uh, uh, thin soils over bedrock or thin soils over a, uh, a root restricting layer, those trees, when you go in and cut, those trees will be subjected to more wind movement. And because of that, you may get some wind through. So be careful with that. The other easy way to resolve this question is call your local DEC office and say, 
can you send out a forester? I need to talk to somebody about the trees in my sugar bush. They come prepaid, your tax dollars at work. So take advantage of that. All right, so now let's think about how to thin and then how to select those trees. And really, the how to thin is a nice way to say how do we kill the trees that we don't like and keep the trees that we do. So the starting point for thinning is to have clearly defined objectives. So you have to know what you're interested in. And as a maple producer, for those of you that are maple producers, the common objective is to have healthy maple trees that produce high, high large quantities of high sugar concentration sap. So that's kind of a given objective. But you may have other objectives. You may want to produce firewood. You may want to have some recreational trails. You may want to mix some high quality saw timber among the uh, sugar bush trees to diversify. So there may be some other kinds of objectives that you have. Uh, you also will want to use directional, or whoever cuts the trees will want to use directional felling. Directional felling is where you decide the direction the tree falls. The tree may be leaning one way, but you have it fall whatever direction you think is going to be most advantageous. Directional felling is accomplished. You learn directional felling through a training program that's called Game of Logging. I know some of you have taken it. Um, Game of Logging was originally developed for loggers because uh, uh, logging is a dangerous occupation and there is a uh, uh, Soren Erikson from Sweden, right? Is that right? He's from Sweden. Came to the U.S. and he said, you know, was, and he said it in a Swedish accent, which I don't do Swedish accents very well, but he basically said, you know, the, your loggers aren't safe and they're not productive. And so he developed this training program that emphasizes safety and emphasizes productivity because if you decide where the tree falls, then you spend less time dealing with problem trees. And you know how the tree is going to fall so you, there's less injury. Uh, directional felling involves a felling plan. You can see that the parts of the felling plan, um, What's, what's most important is that you have a plan. It's no longer a random process. Before I've taken the first three levels of game of logging, before I did that, tree felling was always a random event. Right? It's like buying a lottery ticket. Sometimes you hit it big and sometimes you don't. And, and with directional felling, you're still going to hang up the occasional tree, but you're going you're to do it less frequently and you'll know how to deal with these problems when they, when they occur. Another way to manage trees, to kill the trees that you want, is to girdle them. Um, girdling is an effective, kind of effective way to, to kill trees. Uh, the trees don't necessarily die immediately. When you cut a tree and it falls in the ground, it's dead. A girdled tree may stay alive for a couple of years. The other problem with girdled trees is at some point they will fall and you don't know which direction they will fall. And if you have tubing systems, the only thing you know for sure is that the tree will fall on tubing during one of the big runs of the season. That's just that's the way girdle, this is you know, just something that girdle trees do. So I, I typically um, do not recommend, and as the trees get kind of mid-sized trees, smaller trees I may be less worried about girdling. The mid-sized trees I think are more problematic. Uh, there are good arguments when you have very large trees to girdle them because if you have large trees surrounded by smaller desirable trees, felling that big tree is going to damage some of the smaller desirables. So you, you look at each situation, if you know directional felling, it gives you the option of 300, usually of 360 degrees and, if, and you may be able to steer it away from some of those desirable stems. So that's how you kill the trees. How do you pick the trees that you want to remove? Let's think about what we want to retain. What we want to retain, first of all, is, is a mixture of species. Now some sugar bushes are, just by the way they established, are 100% sugar maple, or essentially 100% sugar maple. That's, that is what it is. For those of you that have a mixture of species, particularly a mixture of hardwoods, try to find uh, about 75%, three out of four sugar maples, or maybe you're tapping red maples, 75% sugar maples and then 25% other hardwoods. And the, the logic for this is based on some research out of Vermont where they were finding that those 
forests that were not monocultures, that had mixtures of species, had a lower incidence of native insect defoliation impacts than those sugar bushes that were 100% sugar maple. It's just the way those insects interacted with the forest. So if you have that mixture, you're, you can expect to have um, maybe less impact of insects. Now, you know, use some common sense as you, as you go to find that mixture. Remember that sugar maple has is a site demanding species. It's going to grow best on the best soils. In most sugar bushes, you'll have areas where you have you know, maybe a low spot that's poorly drained, or you have kind of a high rocky dome that's got thin soils. Those are areas that sugar maple is not going to grow well to begin with. So don't try to force sugar maple to grow there. Let the species like red maple or black cherry or um, poplar or some other species that might grow better on those kind of off quality soils, let those species grow. That makes up your 25% and, and reserve the sugar maple for those higher quality soils. Retain the trees that are high vigor, so they have healthy green crowns low risk, so we'll, we'll look at some pictures of like um, forked stems, stems that, that, are, that are lacking the eutapella cankers and the maple borers, uh, deep wide crowns, we'll talk, I'll show you some pictures of the upper canopy, we're going to go through all of these. And then the, the final thing is, is worry about sap sugar concentrations. After you've gone through maybe a couple of times thinning your woods, then you might be thinking about which trees have the best sugar. All right, so think about which trees you're going to retain. Here I want you to look at the crowns, right? And I don't, none of these are probably sugar maple, but the, the tree that's in the upper left-hand corner has a nice wide crown that looks like a fairly deep crown. The tree that's in the center, this has a decent crown on the lower right-hand side, but the upper left-hand side is, illustrates competition for sunlight. So that tree in the center is, the crown in the center is maybe not bad, but it's not great. And then you have some real loser trees over here. So the trees that you might want to concentrate the growth on would be this tree and maybe this tree. So the best trees, based on the crowns, are going to produce the best results. Um, there are two kinds of forks that you see in the woods. There are forks that are, I'll say, stable and, and non-stable. Non-stable forks, so if, you, if, you, if you're looking at a, a tree that has a fork like this, you won't see it. But when you look sideways on that tree that has a fork, you'll see a bulge beneath the tree, beneath that fork. Anybody seen that? Mm -hmm. okay. What happens is that, is that tree, is, uh, that fork is a weak fork, and it gets wind action or snow or ice, and it splits just a little bit, ever so slightly. I was out in the woods uh, earlier this week, and it was a little bit windy. I was, I was collecting sap research sap samples. I could hear these trees in the wind, they're going popping. And it's that seam is popping. And what happens, that seam pops, and when the tree tries to heal it, and it grows a layer of tissue over. And it does that year after year, and pretty soon you get, I think, of like a, a cobra fan or a cobra head. And you get that bulging beneath the fork of the tree when you look at it from the side of the fork. So when you see that, that's an indication, that's not an indication of a strong fork, that's the indication of a weak fork, and that's a tree that you would want to avoid. Now all forks aren't bad, because you can go into any of your woods and you'll find big trees with forks. Those forks have been there for 80 years, 100 years, 200 years. So a fork by itself doesn't guarantee a problem, but look at the characteristics of those forks. Take this opportunity, if you're thinning, to remove trees that have um, these kinds of problems. That's a structural weakness. If nothing else, this reduces the amount of tappable surface on the tree. Right? And if you tap into this tree, you know, if you were to try and tap this tree here or tap above it, you're not going to dr drill very far before you, hit, you get brown shavings coming out, which is not what you want. Crown class is an important consideration because the trees that have greater access to sunlight, those the trees above the black line, have a better response to thinning. They're better able to utilize the increase of sunlight that comes about after you thin. 
the crown, the, when we talk about crown class, we define crown class as the height of a tree relative to its neighboring trees. Okay? So it's essentially it's either at the same height or higher than the neighboring trees or it's below the neighboring trees. As they get below the neighboring trees, look at the, the shape of the crowns. They're no longer big and broad. They tend to be spindly and deformed. The lower crown class trees have one-third to one-eighth the capacity to respond to a thinning as the upper crown trees do. So if you're, if you're now, by cutting these smaller, I mean, cutting a tree like this isn't going to give any sunlight to that tree, is it? And this is a, a dramatization, but as you, as you look at these trees, you'll start to see, you move back from the side, and you look at it, and you can start to see kind of the vertical layering of the vertical profile in your sugar bush. We talked about species mixture in, in aligning species with soil conditions. So match the species to the soils and try, don't go in with the objective of 100% sugar maple. That's probably not going to play out to your advantage. Now if you, already, if you have a very strong mixture to sugar maple, I'm not suggesting that you would plant, but just be, be alert to those other species, those non-sugar maple species. Okay, if you want to want to try your hand at this, how do you get started? What I would recommend is get some surveyor's tape or forester's tape and go into a corner of your sugar bush. Think about some of the things that we've talked about here and tie some ribbons on the trees that you think you should cut. Then you stand back and look at it and say, what's this going to look like when I get done? Or tie some ribbon on there and then call the local uh, DEC forester to come out and say, let me, tell, let me share my logic with you and you can correct me where I'm wrong, and then you'll have this as a learning process. Um, the, one of the bullets up there that I want to emphasize is that utilization has drawbacks. By utilization, you, know, you cut a tree and it's on the ground, and a lot of people look at that, and there's the, actually the state maple specialist, Steve Childs, has a very strong chip in his brain. A, I call it the, his utilization chip. He can't stand to let a log lay on the ground. Um, he heats with wood. He sells firewood. And, and, and I appreciate that very much. Um, but extraction, utilizing that wood, comes sometimes in a cost. And the value of some wood, there's time involved in it to begin with, and there's also the potential of damage to the, to the trees that you're trying to favor by thinning. So I usually, I'm usually less concerned if the owner is the one that's utilizing because they have a vested interest in the trees that are left behind. I get more nervous when, when maple producers come up and say, oh yeah, I was doing my neighbor a favor, he needed some firewood, and I told him, sure, go ahead and get some. And you don't know what training the neighbor has with a chainsaw. You don't know if the neighbor has the right size tractor or equipment to get in and out effectively. And you don't know if the neighbor really cares about the residual tree. I mean, chances are they do, but they may not have the same concerns that you would show. So be, be alert to those um, opportunities to utilize. The final bullet uh, is about a thinning workshop. I, I do a series of sugar bush thinning workshops around the state. I've did the last two years. I'm going to do some more this um, upcoming summer. If you look, I mentioned the, the website, the CornellForestConnect.ning site has a calendar of events. Look there for the schedule of thinning, sugar bush thinning workshops. Okay, so now let's do a, a, a look at the uh, thinning study. This is where about seven years into this from the from the early um, phases of the research. It's a, it, the pro, from the early phase of the project, is an integrated research and extension project. So we're, we're doing research, again, to thin sugar bushes and look at the response of trees to that thinning, primarily in terms of the sugar concentration. We started this work at the Arnott Forest near Ithaca, uh, and it started almost happenstance. We had a, an area that was thinned to, to demonstrate different harvesting techniques, and when we got the timing of that coincided with me becoming more active in the Cornell Maple program, when we got looking at that woodlot and section of woods, and I said, there's a lot of sugar maple, we can look at the thinning response of these sugar maples. So we started collecting data from that, we developed 
a statewide research project that had a, a uniform uh, cutting pattern and we worked with cooperative extension educators and maple producers. The maple producers provided the trees, we provided the cutting, and then the maple producers and extension educators are collecting that data. The basic design that the Arnott Forest, and I'll show you some data from that, uh, started back in 2003, 2004, where we were looking at trees that had different side, different numbers of sides that were free to grow. So a tree can have either zero sides free to grow or up to four sides free to grow. We're measuring diameter growth rate, uh, sap sugar concentration, and uh, also in some of those trees we're measuring the volume of sap, the flow rate of sap. The sap is always, the sugar concentrations of our research trees are always uh, divided by the, what we call our witness trees. Because sugar concentrations vary every year, we were expecting the research trees to, to be increasing as they had more sunlight, they'd be increasing in sugar, uh, but we, we knew that they would vary from year to year, so we always standardized it by those witness trees. So it's always, the witness trees are always at 100% then our research trees are always above or below 100%. We expanded that to our maple cooperators on 14 different properties. They each have three different research plots. One plot had no cutting, one plot had 20% removal, and one plot had 40% removal. So no cutting is the control, light thinning, and then a heavy thinning. They were monitoring the same uh, measurements on those trees. This is where we, uh, we looked at, um, we visited many, many counties trying to find cooperators that had the, kind of the right configuration of trees. Uh, we ended up with uh, 14. And we started by asking the question, I mean, our assumption is that trees are going to grow faster, they're going to produce more sugar. So first thing we need to say is, do the trees grow faster? And we talked a little bit about this, but I want to illustrate why it's important that the trees are growing fast. If this is a, a representative 12-inch diameter tree, and the, the gray spot here is you drill a hole in a tree. Once you drill that hole, you always have that hole. And what you may or may not realize is when you drill that hole, uh, the hole is, is colonized by microorganisms, mostly bacteria and yeast, and those stain the wood. And, and the tree recognizes that hole as an injury, as it should, and sugar maple trees have, a, all trees have this process, but sugar maple is effective at compartmentalizing a wound. So it isolates the wound, it knows that it's going to be infected to the extent the trees know these things. And it prevents the microorganisms from spreading into, the new, into other parts of the tree. So it seals off a column of wood 16 inches, at least 16 inches above and below the tap hole. So you, you can envision a rec, essentially a rectangle of wood that's no longer functional to move sap. That's 32 inches long, about an inch wide, and then however deep you drill your hole. Does that make sense? So this is a column of discoloration. So if you've ever seen a, a board that comes out of a tree, you see those streaks, that's what's happening. Well, when you drill a hole in a 12-inch tree, that one-inch hole you can, if you remember the relationship between diameter and circumference and pi, 12 inches times 3.15 whatever pi is, gives you about 37 one inch points of entry around that tree. And, by, and that assumes that you don't have some kind of a defect on the side of the tree. You can drill 37 holes or 37 years before you come back to where you started. Right? So the tree has to be growing fast enough so that in 37 years you've grown enough wood that you don't drill back into that column of stain. Because if you drill back into that column of stain, you've added oxygen to a section of wood that had been previously without oxygen. It was anaerobic. So you, you, you drill into it and uh, you add oxygen to that stain, you activate those microorganisms and you allow the microorganisms to come back into the rest of the tree. So you've, you've now you've, you've provided a, a mechanism for those decay organisms to have oxygen and to spread. 
Be rich. We can hear you. Um, so if you have a 12 inch tree and let's say your, da your, your tapping depth is one and three quarters inch, then you need to have diameter growth of three and a half inches over 37 years. That's not really very much. That's a, about a tenth of an inch, or as it says here, 0 0.09 inches of diameter growth per year. That obviously varies with the smaller the tree, the faster the tree needs to be growing, the deeper it is, the faster the tree needs to be growing. But from that, for any diameter of tree, we can calculate the minimum um, diameter growth that's necessary to comply with the tapping guidelines. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It felt like a very long-winded way to, to get to that point. So, for each of our research trees, and these are these are the research plots are collaborators, and we broke out the collaborators. We, we said. There are some collaborators whose trees have an average diameter less than 10 inches. Collaborators, tree diameter that is, has an average diameter between 10 and 14. And then the research collaborators that had tree diameters that were greater than 14 inches. For each of those, and these are all averages, for each of those we have the control trees, the 20% cut, and the 40% cut. What we found was that only the trees that were in plots that had been thinned were growing fast enough to reach that um, minimum diameter growth. So this blue bar is the minimum diameter growth that's necessary. None of the control trees were growing fast enough to comply with the assumptions of the tapping guidelines, only in the thinned plots. Now that doesn't mean you can't tap these trees. And for a lot of years, you can get away with tapping those trees. But at some point, and some of you have experienced this, you find, it gets hard to find clean wood to tap into, doesn't it? You tap in, you get brown wood shavings. Go to another spot, tap in, you get brown wood shavings. So you want this faster tree growth. And what we also recommend now is that you use what's called a pattern tapping. So you don't, it used to be, at least at the Arnott Forest and in many sugar bushes, you just kind of walk up to the tree and say, oh, that's a good spot, and you drill. You come back the next year, oh, well, okay, I'll drill here. So what we do now in our, all of our trees, 2,000 trees, is every year when we pull the spiles, they get a little spot of paint. And that does two things. One, it makes it really easy to know where not to tap. And then we just we offset, and then by a little bit, you know, you want at least an inch, usually I go over two inches, and then either up or down four to six inches. So you want to very much avoid that vertical column, and then offset, um, and then Typically, you don't want to go right on the same height. Okay, this, um, this is in that first area, so it was a slightly different, uh, it was not set up as a research design, it was just taking advantage of some cutting. And because we didn't have the 0, 20, 40, what I did was I looked at the lower canopy trees, which were less than 12 inches, and compared them to the upper canopy trees, and then I, I categorize the trees as having zero sides free to grow, which is the, the left, all the way up to four sides free to grow. And what we found was that only those trees, that only the upper canopy trees that had at least two sides free to grow were growing fast enough to comply with the tapping guidelines. So it's important the trees need a minimum amount of release in order to be growing quickly. So, at one level we weren't very surprised. Foresters have known for a hundred years when you thin your woods the trees grow faster. But we felt it was important to illustrate this within a sugar bush and then also to put it in the context of these tapping guidelines. The real question though is what happens to sap sugar concentrations? Well we have some preliminary results. This is looking at the, that, so this is the area that was not the 0 20 40. It was our first area, and this is the first two years after thinning. We would not expect very much of a response right away. The tree, remember, the tree is going to respond to the thinning by having increases in leaves, and those leaves are going to increase more fully. So we thought it would take at least a couple of years for the response to develop. So this is looking at the first two years. Uh, these are the witness trees, and it makes sense the bigger trees are closer to the witness trees than the smaller trees are 
but the witness trees have that uh, are at 100 percent, and so we're always relative to the 100 percent. If we look at the years 2006 to 2011, let's uh, so. Look at these. Notice the heights of these trees, both the lower canopy and the upper canopy. You know, here we're about 90%. You know, here we're a little over 90, and here we're about 100 or a little above 100%. Look at the average of the next several years, and you can see that we're gaining, even in the lower canopy, maybe 10%, and over here we're gaining as much as 20% increase in sugar relative to our witness trees. Uh, I'm going to jump past these. So let's look at our uh, maple producers. These are the maple producers that have uh, the smaller diameter trees. And we see the blue, the dark blue is the control, so that's always going to be at 1 or it will be 100%. The red is the 20% thinning, the green is the 40% thinning. This is looking at the first three years, 2007 through 2009. 2010, remember what happened to the maple season, 2010? Bad. It was our worst year in, on record. Uh, what well, about 2011? So, so in 2010, nobody got any sap. We didn't get any data from the collaborators. 2011 was a great year. Everybody's making certain we didn't get growth, we didn't get any sap data for 2011 either. So we, this is only looking at those first three years. What it shows us for these smaller um, diameter trees is that early on there's a, there's a pulse, but it drops down, particularly in the heavy thinning. We have an initial loss of sugar concentration, probably from what the foresters know of as a shock of thinning. We see that same pattern but more dramatically as we go into bigger trees. So the bigger the trees are, the greater the, res the greater the negative initial response to thinning. So there's a loss of sugar concentration, but what appears to be a recovery. So the red is the 20%, the green is the 40%, a decline, but then what appears to be a recovery. So we really need, this year we're putting a strong press to make sure we get research data from all of our collaborators. And on the bigger size trees, the same basic pattern. A, a thinning shock, a decline in sugar, what in the first two years and then by the third year, what appears to be a recovery. So what do we likely conclude from all of this? Um, thinning is going to, uh, particularly in the upper canopy trees, increases the growth rates and probably over time will increase sugar concentrations. Uh, sugar, sugar maple trees that have at least two sides free to grow are going to have the best response to growth and best response to sugar. And the growth response, the diameter growth in the sugar concentration is most favorable in sugars, sugar bushes with an average tree diameter less than 10 inches, but all sugar maple trees respond. Uh, there's an, an initial decline in sugar concentration, but that appears to recover by year three. And what we saw in the, the area where we started was that by year seven, we had up to a 20-some percent response in sugar concentrations. So what do we recommend? And I'll stop with this, and we can have some questions. Uh, if you have a young sugar bush, start thinning as early as you can in your, in your younger sugar bushes, particularly if you're going to be tapping it in a few years, get in there as soon as, as soon as possible, and certainly before you start tapping to thin that sugar bush. Give it a couple of years to recover. It's also, I find that maple producers, you know, it's really hard to get them to cut a tree that they've already tapped because you have a, pers <laughs> you have a personal relationship with that tree, and you've seen the averages that the average tapped tree gives you a quart of syrup. So you just imagine that every tree is giving you a quart, which it isn't. So you're, you're reluctant to cut those trees. So if you can cut them, and it's okay to cut a maple tree. I want you to know that. It is okay. There's no, there's no long term. You know, it's not sinful for a maple producer to cut a maple tree. Um, monitor the larger trees and thin lightly, particularly, so more like at a 20% level with, when you're working with those larger diameter trees. The, probably the best cutting intensity will vary from producer to producer. Both the light thinning and the heavy thinning showed 
an initial decline and then what seems to be a recovery. So I would, I would adjust the thinning intensity depending upon how you're working in your woods. If you're doing your own cutting and you have a tractor or an ATV and you're utilizing the wood to whatever extent you are, I'd cut lightly and just kind of work your way through your sugar bush a little bit at a time. If you're working with a logger and you know it's going to be 15 years before you have another operation, cutting operation, or you have a, an extensive tubing system and you know you're going to replace that tubing system every 15 years, synchronize the thinning with whatever else you have going on in your woods. Okay, um, final point I'll, I'll make here, and you all have this as a handout, uh, measure your trees before you tap them. Right? Those smaller size trees, well, they're not growing fast enough, they're really not producing much sap volume, and they're, they're not really producing very high sugar concentration. So make sure you're at those minimum diameters. I don't think you can, from the wounding that you do to the tree, in my observation, on those smaller trees, you're not recovering enough sap to justify it. You know, the, we've, I found some seven and eight inch diameter trees in the r not that were tapped. So everybody, I'll say everybody, almost everybody does it. Try not to do it, there's, there's really not any 